All right. Revelation 12, 11 says, We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. My life before recovery was insane. I was insecure, rebellious child. I had a sense of abandonment, rejection, and unworthiness. My parents, in a sense, were my first drug dealers because they gave me everything I wanted in their weaknesses. My dad worked two jobs to satisfy my mom's fake high-class profile. Uh, his being gone all the time left me feeling void on the inside and in search of something that could fulfill it. I began looking for love in all the wrong places. My mom was emotionally despondent except for her role in the church as church pianist. I never saw my parents communicate. I don't remember my mom ever telling me she loved me or hugging me, but I'm pretty sure she inherited that from her mom. My need for discipline began showing at a young age as my behavior became more rebellious. I began drinking around 15 years old, trying to people please or be cool. From this point on, one drink was never enough. I had too much freedom and not enough self-control or discipline. With a performance-based view of love, I became pregnant at 17 with my first husband and graduated high school married. I was judged, condemned, looked down upon, and full of pain. My mom brought it to my attention that I could have an abortion, which caused a lot of pain, a lot more pain, as my, my desire to be needed by her grew. I chose not to have an abortion, and she told me I couldn't live at home anymore, so we got married. I was codependent, and I had low self-esteem, and trying to hide a sin by not having a baby out of wedlock. Postpartum came into my life, and I had it, and after seeking the image of having a 17-year-old pre-baby body, I became desperate to lose weight. I took some drugs that were offered to me by my ex-husband, and I began to spiral further down with a new love for meth and alcohol. After two children and 10 years, the marriage fell when he got another woman pregnant. The pain was unbearable, and I tried to commit suicide with the mindset that I couldn't make anyone love me or keep it together. I could not figure out how or why to nail down my problems. Paul describes this in Romans 7, 7, Romans 7, 7 through 25. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Yet over the next two years, I was going to learn about the law of sin nature and being born of the Spirit. Leaving two children behind, I hit the streets of Atlanta. I cannot count the number of times I used the phrase, I'm sowing my wild oats. My only friend during this time was an infamous mafia leader's daughter. This alone was the most dangerous entanglement that I was ensnared by. I had free drugs, free places to live, free security with the police, free alcohol, and VIP to any club across three states. I was caught up in manufacturing meth with a coffee maker and growing pure crystallized meth using chemistry. My first attempt to get help came after I was high on eight different illegal drugs at one time. The cops had dropped me off at Grady Hospital in downtown Atlanta. My dad and my stepmom picked me up from the 13th floor psych ward, and I stayed with them for a very short time. It didn't take long before I had convinced my father that I was not that bad, and I was back on the streets of Atlanta. My nine-month wild oat sowing in Atlanta ended soon after I met my new best friend, my now husband of 11 years. We slowly developed a friendship grounding, grounded in my trusting him. This was a high, a high I had not seen yet. However, my body and mind still craved drugs and alcohol through my addiction. I became pregnant with number three and got married again in an effort to make things right and not have another baby out of wedlock again. My feelings of rejection and unworthiness grew stronger after his family and church rejected me based on my past of being divorced. We moved forward soon after number three, but my postpartum came back with a vengeance. My lowest point had led me to a small motel one mile from our house. I had no clothes, no money, cell phone, no car, no power, no family. I screamed out at the drugs in my hand how much I hated them for destroying me. And in the parking lot with only a security light, I begged God to take my life but to please take care of my family and let them know I didn't need to hurt them. And for the first time in my life, I had prayed a sacrificial prayer like Jesus to take my life, but to save them. My husband had also been praying, and I finally admitted the hardest thing to him I'd ever had to say, I need help. He chose to love me for who I was and not what I was doing. 
I called my dad, who was my enabler, to share the shame once more looking for his acceptance, and for the first time, he didn't give it to me. Then I became free to search for my Heavenly Father. They say a person can hit rock bottom when their family allows them to, and I agree. Now I know that God is the rock at the bottom. God's word in Psalm 40 and 2 was beginning to sow into my heart after my plea for help. It says, He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet upon a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. The feelings of guilt and shame for leaving my family were almost too much to bear. My flesh screamed, how could I leave another child after already leaving two? The truth was, I'd never really been there for them to begin with. What was the next 12 months of pain compared to a lifetime of a healed mom for them? I went to a rehab, a rehab called Second Chances. It was modeled after Teen Challenge, started by David Wilkerson for the gangs in New York. It was very hardcore, but I needed hardcore help. I was in with other 14 ladies, ladies they were court ordered and we all had different issues ranging from food, theft, sexual and drug abuses. We were all different yet the same. We all long for healing and power to change which can only come through the Holy Spirit. I was the only one married with children and there by my own will. Amazingly the discipline was so tough some of those ladies chose to go back to jail. The first week I, I was there I was put on a communication fast. It, meant it lasted 16 weeks, and this meant no one could communicate with me, and I could not communicate with anyone else. This, this fast trained me to discipline my impulsive thoughts and actions. They also put me on a 30-day image fast. I couldn't wear makeup, hairspray, jewelry, hair gel, or nail polish. This took my focus off my outward appearance and forced me to look inwardly. If I broke these fasts or other rules, I would be disciplined. A few forms of discipline were writing and memorizing scripture, which I began to love, all-day housework, missed phone time, and missed visits. My first write-up was after I walked into a room and turned the light on without permission. I had 16 disciplines my first two months. I wrote 27 letters in my first two weeks, and I had eight notebooks of prayers and thoughts for four, after four months. Any requests, complaints, or personal items I needed, I was told to put a note in the box, which meant pray, only God can help you. No more going to Walmart, Family Dollar, or McDonald's. Tired of them not helping me, I began praying. Slowly, God started revealing himself to me as he met needs that I had prayed for through the other ladies. Then my trust for him began to grow. I learned that my drugs and alcohol were the least of my problems. I'll never forget how freeing it was to learn that I only had a drug and alcohol problem. It was the reasons why I used that I had to face. I underwent a complete transformation as I learned a lot about myself, forgiveness, and was willing to go back into my past and begin healing by taking spiritual inventory. The most important teaching that I learned in rehab was how to be a wife and a loving mother. If I couldn't learn this, then no ministry in my life was going to work. It starts at home. The Word of God healed my wounds and established a newfound faith as taught by Paul in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Jesus Christ. His Word comforted me as I was in class four to six hours a day, studying, writing reports, and memorizing Scripture. Rehab provided a safe environment for me to live while getting to know God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The counselors will say, your only job is to wake up thanking God, spend all day praising God, and go to bed thanking God again. The rehab in itself did not save me, and neither will Celebrate Recovery in itself save you. Second Chances and Celebrate Recovery are faith-based programs that point you in the right direction, and they help sustain you with godly support. The process I had to go through was really hard, and I cried many hours on many days. But I see how God created a hunger for me, a hunger in my life that only He could fill. My husband and I committed to the year-long program, but after four months, the program disbanded and I was able to come home before Christmas. My husband was a codependent person with other struggles, and he was allowing God to heal him while I was away. Watching God transform him into a godly husband and father was so rewarding, and learning to live with someone that's no longer sick is a very big change. 
We knew it was going to be difficult as we had to learn to stand up to the truth of God's Word to our family, friends. We had to change people, places, and things. Gradually, we were united, one in spirit. We've never mentioned the past again when arguing out of respect for what God has done for our lives. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one, for they have a good return for their work. And it also says, A cord of three strands is not easily broken. We minister together. Six months after rehab, I started my own rehab ministry called Lifeline Ministries in South Georgia. In all these situations, I can now cope knowing that I have God to turn to. This eases my suffering. In fact, God says through Paul in Romans 5, 3, we are to rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. I hope you can see through my testimony that these words are to be true. The Holy Spirit has led me through the 12 steps of Celebrate Recovery. It teaches you how to focus on the solution and not the problem. I understand what structure and discipline mean and why are they so needed as we struggle to tame our own impulsive thoughts and behaviors. Also, I know the program doesn't work for everyone as everyone does not fully embrace or fully trust what God is doing in their lives. This is where God teaches me grace and mercy. I'm thankful to North Point Church and Miss Kitty for trusting me to be the training coach and 12-step women's leader for Celebrate Recovery. My name is Beth Parker. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And I've been delivered from alcoholism, chemical dependency, codependency, domestic violence, adultery, emotional, physical, and sexual abuses. I struggle with anxiety and fear. Thank you.